innovation is change that unlocks new value. May I invite today's chief guest, Professor Rishikesha T. Krishnan, Director IIM Bengaluru, to address the gathering and deliver his talk on Can India Become an Innovation Powerhouse? Yeah, namaste and uh, good morning. First of all, let me congratulate all of you and wish you all the best on the occasion of the Foundation Day, both of CSIR and of CFTRI. CSIR has a long tradition going back to 1942. And of course, CFTRI itself has a long tradition, almost as long. And I must congratulate and compliment all of you for keeping and maintaining that tradition and doing excellent work in an area which is very critical to the country. I mean, one part of food security, of course, is agriculture. But the other part of food security is making sure we don't waste what we grow. And I think CFTRI plays a very important role in processing and taking forward food after harvest. So I think this is a, will continue to be a very important area in the years to come. Uh, the topic of my uh, talk this morning is uh, can India become an innovation powerhouse? So this is really driven by the work I have been doing over the last almost three decades, where I've been trying to understand what drives innovation in India and what are the barriers to innovation in India. So in my introduction, two books of mine were mentioned. This is the first book which I wrote uh, quite some time ago in 2010, where I tried to understand at the national level, what are the barriers to innovation and what do we need to do at the policy level to enhance our innovation outcomes. But when I wrote this book, many of my friends told me, you know, the problem is not only at the policy level, you also need to look at what needs to be done at the organizational level. So along with another colleague of mine, Vinay Dabulkar, we had written another book called Eight Steps to Innovation, Going from Jugaad to Excellence, which essentially focuses on how individual corporates and organizations can develop what we call systematic innovation capabilities. So this is just to give you a little bit of background. So I'm going to try and address during the course of the next 25 minutes to half an hour, the question which I asked you, which is, can India become an innovation powerhouse? And if so, what is it that we need to do to move towards that objective? So I'll start by just going over something very simple, which is why is it that innovation, particularly technological innovation is so important? There are multiple reasons, but a few which stand out. The first is simple, simply strategic reasons. You know, in the past that India has sometimes not had access to critical technologies that were important for our development. So to have access to the technologies we need is always a very, very important part of our self-reliance. So that's one of the reasons we need to develop our own technology. We also sometimes need to avoid what you might call hold up. You might recall that during the COVID crisis, while we had the ability to manufacture vaccines domestically, we did not have access to all the raw materials and intermediates that go into those vaccines. So there was actually an occasion when our foreign minister had to visit the US to seek access to some of the essential raw materials which went into the vaccines because there was an embargo on their export from the US. The third reason we also need to look at innovation is because we sometimes need very low cost solutions, particularly to enhance access, to enhance affordability. It's important that we have solutions that suit our requirements. You might remember an important example, which is the Rotavac, a vaccine which was developed against the rotavirus. This was developed thanks to work done at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences by Dr. M.K. Ban and others, and was finally commercialized by Bharat Biotech. And today it allows India to combat the rot rotavirus in a much more effective way. And finally, of course, in many industries, we would like to attain a leadership position. The Indian motorcycle industry is a good example where India is one of the largest motorcycle markets in the world. And we also have three Indian companies which dominate that market, even though some of the top multinationals are present in India in that industry. So Hero, TVS and Bajaj have a significant proportion of the motorcycle market. And this has been possible because they have not only developed technological capabilities, but also the abilities to design and operate a successful supply chain as well as to ensure that they have products which meet the needs of customers in the Indian market. So I think this is the reason why we need to focus a lot on technological innovation. 
But now let's look a little bit at where do we stand today. To understand where we need to move forward, obviously we need to understand our position at the current time and also how it has changed over time. If you just go back to the time of independence, which was you know just a few years after CSIR itself was born, you will remember that India did not have access to some of the critical technologies which we required to develop our industrial capability. Take the case of steel. At that time, we had very small steel making capacity in India and steel was an essential input to almost all the industrial requirements that we had at that time. So we had to first learn how to produce steel, for which purpose, of course, you know, we went into collaboration agreements with steel producers in other countries at that time, mainly from the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc. So our first challenge was to learn how to produce. How do you take the technology from one of those sources and make it work in India? As time went by, the challenge was no longer just to make it work, but to make it work efficiently, which means how do I make sure that my output per unit input is comparable to what the original source of the technology is able to achieve. And still later, we came to the third stage, which is saying, can we actually move to the frontier? Can we be at the same level or even better than other countries across the world as far as steel production is concerned? This was approximately the stage we were at when economic liberalization started around the early 90s. And then, of course, we realized that just doing good in process innovation is not enough. You also need to be able to innovate and improve products. And that has been one of the important developments in the post-liberalization era. Now, if you again look at, take a snapshot of where India stands over the last 30 years, since economic liberalization started, you will realize that there are still some challenging areas which we need to address. If you look broadly at what drives innovation in any country, there are three sets of factors. One is input factors. Do you have the right people? Do you have adequate financial resources? Do you have the right knowledge? Do you have the appropriate infrastructure? Then there is also the external side or the incentive to innovate, which says, does the environment provide the right incentive for firms and organizations to undertake innovative activities? And there important things are, for example, is there a high degree of competition? If you actually innovate, will you get the benefits of that innovation? which really talks about things like the intellectual property rights regime. Does the market value innovation, for example, if you're an innovative company, will the stock market value you at a higher level? This is the second set of factors. And the third, which is equally important, is what happens inside organizations, inside a company, inside a CSIR lab, inside a university. Is there the capacity to innovate? Do you have the right structures, processes, incentive systems within the organization, which makes the organization or propels the organization to innovate on a sustained basis. My assessment is if you look over the last 30 years, while the right hand side, the external environment has certainly become more appreciative of innovation, perhaps on the other two sides, on both the input side, as well as the innovation capabilities within organizations, there is still some room to go, or in other words, we still have several things we need to do on those two dimensions. Let me just give you some data. For convenience, I'm taking this from the Global Innovation Index report. The latest report just came out, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to update with the latest. So I'm taking from last year's report. But actually, there's not significant change between last year and this year. So you don't have to worry. It's fairly representative of even the latest data. So if you look at gross expenditure on R&D, which is a very broad aggregate measure of what kind of R&D is happening in the country, what you see is that, and this is well known, I'm sure to most of you, that gross expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP was less than or just a close to 0.7% in India, whereas in most comparative countries, it is well above 1%, and in the innovation leaders, it could be anywhere from 2 to 3%. The data here compares India and China, and India had 0.7 versus China, which had 2.4%. If you again dig a little deeper into the reason for this, you will find that one of the reasons is the composition of our industrial structure. The two industries in India, which are the most R&D intensive, happen to be transportation and pharmaceuticals. 
and this has been true for many years but if you look globally at which are the industries where a lot of the innovation is focused you will find it's in things like semiconductors electronics it etc so one of the reasons india's r and d spend is not very high is because we don't have significant presence in those industries of course you could say which way is the causality but this is true that we don't have a strong presence in the industries which are the most r and d intensive a related challenge is that in india r and d continues to be driven largely by the government unlike most of the countries in the world where r and d is largely driven today by the business sector so in most countries you will find that r and d expenditure by the industry is something like 60 to 70% and industry i'm sorry government would be 20 30% in india that ratio is flipped so one of the challenges we have is also making sure that the industry takes on more of the responsibility for r and d again when you dig a little deeper you will find there are some reasons for this as well here i'm comparing the top r and d spenders in india and china again using data from the global innovation index report you will see that in india the three largest spenders on r and d last year were tata motors sun pharma and aurobindo pharma transportation and pharma that's the same thing i told you earlier whereas in china it's huawei alibaba and tencent these are all companies which are driving a lot more contemporary digital and technological innovation but uh, i would draw your attention to the amount they are spending on r and d look at india stop which is tata motors spent about 2 billion euros in uh, the year which is reported here which is 2021 whereas huawei spent 17 billion euros in the same year so it's almost a ratio of you know 10 is to 1 or 8 is to 1 or something like that that's the difference in the investment and that again is partly accounted for by the industries in which india has a strong presence so you also know and i think i should maybe i should make this point at the, at this stage that some of our new programs like the pli program are trying to bring in investment into industries like semiconductors which are also the most r and d intensive industries in the world so maybe in a few years once we establish a strong presence in semiconductors <coughs> excuse me you will see some of these numbers changing once again if you look at high tech manufactured exports and you compare india and china you will see that high tech exports in india in 2020 was about 21 billion us dollars whereas in china it was 757 billion dollars of course let me also caution you this is manufactured exports this is not service exports in service exports india does quite well but in manufactured exports which is essentially talking about tech, high tech products china of course has a huge advantage and once again in the pli type schemes we are trying to address this challenge as we go forward now universities and academic institutions are an important bedrock of all innovation this data i'm sure you have seen in the newspaper because it's talked about very often what you will find that india's top ranked institutions whether you take us you take any of the rankings typically are in the 150 to 200 range compared to say china which has institutions even in the top 20 so these are just some of the challenges you can see that we have to address going forward as we look at innovation in india and if you just look at this all in aggregate what you find is that india's rank on all the seven pillars of the global innovation index report actually leaves a lot to be desired in fact the one on which we are the best is market sophistication but on many of the others we still have a long way to go by the way this this was last year's rank was 40 this year's rank is also 40 so this is just to tell you that our rank at least in the last one year has not changed as far as the global innovation index is concerned okay now i'm going to look at this from a different direction now one important thing to look at is what is actually the kind of innovation happening in india so a friend of mine dr daya sindhu who was our student earlier he and i tried to understand what are the top innovations in india over the last decade and how do these compare to the top innovations in india from the previous decade the reason we undertook this activity is to try and understand how is innovation changing in india so if we compare the top 10 in the previous decade to the top 10 in this decade maybe we'll get a sense of how innovation is changing so let me just quickly run you through what are the top 10 in this decade then i'll tell you a little bit about the previous decade and then quickly compare them and draw a few conclusions so if you look at the top 10 innovations in the most recent decade 
One was obviously Aadhaar because clearly no other country has a biometric identity system on this scale. And this has been a very important foundation for many other innovations that have taken place including payment systems and so on. So it's been one of the most significant innovations. Second one of course has been vaccines. I already spoke about Rotavac but then we also have Covaxin which played an important role as far as our response to COVID virus is concerned. The third important innovation we found in the last decade was UPI. India has perhaps the largest digital payment network in the world and the most important thing about it is that it is agnostic to any particular operator. It's totally interoperable. It doesn't matter which bank you are on or who you are, you can transfer money to somebody else. We also have some pockets of the electronics industry where we are doing very well. In the optical networking space, there's a company called Tejas Networks, which was acquired by uh, Tata's last year, which is one of the leaders globally in this area. So that's the fourth important innovation. The fifth is, I know in, in many of us sometimes find practical difficulties using something called GEM, which is a payment platform for purchase, but it's an important innovation as far as government is procurement is concerned. Because as you all know, government is one of the largest buyers in the country and to enable a digital and electronic marketplace for government purchase offers the potential for significant savings, which is what GEM already reports. What we are also seeing is a lot of interesting innovation in public policy. Many of you would know that our development in India is very heterogeneous. We have some parts of India which are comparable to Europe on human development indicators and some parts of India which are only comparable to sub-Saharan Africa. So we have both extremes. So how do you bring up or how do you enable those parts of India which are not there to really come up to the level of the better off areas? That's what the aspirational district program of Niti Aayog does. It does something very interesting. First, instead of calling districts backward as they used to be called, they gave it a much more positive label which is aspirational. Second, they look very closely at data comparison between these districts. They try to create a sense of competition between the district administrations of all these aspirational areas. And using this competition, they have and a focus on data, they have driven significant improvement in some of them. Interestingly, they have now realized you need to go even one level lower. So now it has been converted into an aspirational block program from this year onwards. The seventh important area where we saw innovation was in terms of testing kits for COVID. I don't think I need to elaborate that. And the eighth one we saw was in the area of drugs and pharmaceuticals. Now, many of you would know that India is a leader in the pharmaceutical industry, but largely in the generics industry, which means we are very good at processes, but not necessarily very good at discovering new molecules. One example to this is thyroglitazar, a molecule which was created by a pharma company called Zydus Cadilla. This is the first new chemical entity which has gone all the way from discovery in India through all the steps of validation, testing and certification to enter the market and become a commercial proposition. So this was a very important landmark which we achieved in the year 2013 when Saroglitazar was launched in the Indian market. Another area where our innovations have been very good has been in uh, the whole medical diagnostic area. We have uh, Forest which is a company which uses AI and a very low cost detection device to find various problems with your eye. And similarly, we have Niramai, which uses thermal methods, thermal imaging to be able to detect breast cancer early without any kind of invasive method or radiation. And of course, we have Mangalyan, which was one of the world's most efficient and at the same time successful Mars missions. So this is just to give you an idea of what are the prominent innovations we identified for the year 2011 to 2020. Now, the interesting question I want to look at is how do these compare with the previous decade? Now, if you look at the previous decade, and I'm not giving you the full list here, many of the innovations in the previous decade were in the transportation space. For example, there were uh, electric cars like the Reva. There was, uh, of course, the advanced light helicopter. There was the Nano. There was the Titan Edge watch, which is the slimmest water-resistant watch in the world. 
so a lot of the innovation in the earlier decade was more in the product space so if you compare the two if you compare 20 sorry 2001 to 2010 with 2011 to 2020 the first thing you see in 2011 to 2020 is that high impact innovation a lot of it has been in the public domain it has been at national scale it's been based on important platforms and digital and data are important drivers whether you look at aadhar you look at upi you look at gem all of these are characterized by these particular characteristics and these have enabled a whole set of systems to come up on top of them including the whole uh, api based digital system for financial inclusion which is today enabling us to bring many more people into the banking network what's also interesting is that a major arena for innovation in the most recent decade has been healthcare of course partly driven by covid but it's also important to see the shift which has happened and how a lot of our innovation is really happening in that space the third important observation at least from our perspective is that these big very visible corporate innovation programs tata nano was a good example we are not seeing so many of those happening today at least they are even if they are happening they are not getting the kind of visibility which they were getting earlier and even large multinationals which were trying to do what were called for india in india innovation programs even those are not happening to the same degree as they were happening more than a decade ago another important thing of course which is a counter to this is that startups which were not a major force for innovation in the earlier decade are a major force for innovation today so just to kind of quickly sum up one is public innovation is certainly playing a big role but it's important to notice that this is not public innovation in the traditional sense upi aadhar these did not happen in our typical government r&d labs these happened through new organizational mechanisms some of them happened through volunteer effort they involved people from the it industry they involved people sometimes working off the radar not necessarily in a formal establishment so there are a lot of interesting changes happening in the way innovation is getting established and is taking shape but one of the interesting things you see even in the latest decade is that deep tech innovation or techn technological innovation leading to products and technologies at the cutting edge that still seems to be a challenge both in the previous decade as well as this one what have been some of the important enablers of course one important enabler has been the digital backbone it's been organizations like npci which have diffused upi across the country it's some of these new models i was telling you about there is a, for example an organization called i spirit which brings together volunteers from the tech domain and helps create some of these new platforms this group is for example trying to build today a digital health platform so these are the kind of new initiatives which are happening of course there are important government policies like startup india and so on before i come to the last part of my presentation which is you know what what should we be doing going forward i just like to underline a few important recent developments which have the potential to create a transformative effect across the economy one is of course the creation of the national research foundation with a very ambitious budget of about 50000 crores over the next 5 years so if this actually happens a lot of the challenges we have had with research funding in the past should go away the second important thing we are seeing is that increasingly we seem to be able to get access to some technologies we were not able to access in the past hopefully we will be able to absorb these technologies and build on them good example is the fighter aircraft engine technology which for which we signed an agreement with g some time ago there's a whole new effort on indian space policy where we are trying to see whether we can get isro to be at the cutting edge of new technology but making more routine space activities undertaken by the private sector and startups that also promises to unleash a whole lot of innovation and of course the successful chandrayaan 3 mission which has enthused a lot of us and given us a lot of motivation going forward okay now let me come to the last part of my presentation which is what do we need to do going forward so i think i've given you the broad contours of where the challenges are challenges are for example in r and d spending challenges are in the arenas in which we work 
Challenges are also in how we innovate within organizations. One big issue is also with the academic sector and the kind of innovation it does. So I'm going to break up my final recommendations into four parts. The government, established companies, startups, and finally academia and research institutions. Let me start with the government. To, um, it, to my mind, one of the most successful programs which the government has run over the last 10 to 15 years is the BIRAC program of the Department of Biotechnology. And the reason BIRAC has been so successful is that it has not only provided funding across the entire value chain, it has also provided funding across the life cycle of the organization, from startups to companies which are scaling up to even to mature companies and to different players, whether it be academic institutions, research institutions, startups, established companies, etc. So this is a good role model for what we should be doing in other industries and sectors. And I hope it can be replicated in other sectors as well. Second thing government needs to do, which it's doing in a way, but we should do more of it, is structured programs for technology development in critical areas. We had a collaborative automotive research program several years ago, which enabled the development of a lot of key technologies, which were required for light weighting and for becoming more energy and environmentally efficient. We even had some specialized startups coming out of this program. We need to replicate such programs in areas where we need to develop technology for the future. Another important thing we need to do is to identify and coordinate requirements. R&D and technology has a long life cycle. If once the product need is already felt, you ask for the technology, it's too late to start developing it. So we need to have better coordination between people who need things and people who are developing things so that there's better anticipation of requirements. We did a little bit of this during COVID in emergency circumstances when we set up different consortiums to enable availability of reagents, test kits, etc. But these things need to be replicated even in normal times. Regulators also need to change the way they work. Luckily, that's happening in a small way. The Reserve Bank of India, for example, has already created this idea of what are called regulatory sandboxes. They, of course, need to protect the integrity of the financial system. But at the same time, they realize they need to provide some experimental space for fintech companies to, so that they can try out new technology. This has already been done in the area of retail payments and cross-border payments. It needs to be extended to other areas as well. Government procurement plays a critical role. And we saw how during the vaccine crisis during COVID, the government's assurance of procuring from both the Serum Institute as well as Bharat Biotech enabled both of them to build capacity. And this will continue to be an important role the government has to play going forward. Let me now come to established companies. One of the things companies need to realize is that developing innovation capabilities is not a quick job. It's something you need to develop step by step over the years. One of the companies I've been interacting with quite a bit in the last year is a company called Praj Industries based in Pune. Now Praj had a very interesting origin. The origin of Praj was really focused on how do you convert sugarcane molasses into alcohol? Because essentially, we have a thriving sugarcane industry, and a lot of the waste of that could actually be converted into alcohol, which of course has multiple applications. So Pramod Chaudhary, who is the founder of Praj, whose photo you see on this slide, he essentially tried to first bring in a technology from abroad, like normally happens. Then he realized that technology doesn't work very well in India because the molasses is not in very good condition. So he had to adapt it, change it, finally make it work with Indian inputs. But then, of course, he's not stopped there. I'm just fast forwarding a lot. Today, Praj is the government's partner in trying to produce biofuels at all the refineries of the three major fuel oil companies, IPC, uh, sorry, IOC, HPCL, and BPCL are all working with Praj today to take agricultural residues and convert them into biofuel. This is a journey which started with molasses all those years ago. But today, Praj has the ability, it's already demonstrated at the pilot plant level, to have a reasonably efficient process to make that conversion happen. 
and Praj is the technology partner to all these three. But this is a 30, 40 year journey. It's not something that happens overnight. So we need more Indian companies which commit to taking this long term journey. And companies, of course, need to build on their innovation capabilities like Praj. Biocon is another good example, which took its core fermentation capability and then applied it to another industry where the value addition was much higher. So they took the fermentation in technology, which incidentally came from the food industry. And then they took that fermentation capability and started using it in the pharma industry, which is, of course, much more profitable. We also need good technology adopters with absorption capabilities because you finally you need to deploy, you need to diffuse, you need to test, you need to adopt technologies. A company like Eureka Forbes, for example, does that very well in the water purification business. What we are increasingly seeing is that large companies also need to collaborate effectively with startups. This is not a capability that comes automatically to them. And in fact, many multinationals have shown that they are better at this so far than Indian companies. Cisco is an example of a multinational working in India, which collaborates a lot with Indian startups. One of the reasons they're so successful is they're very clear about why they are collaborating with startups. There are three reasons. Either they want to track a new technology or they want to associate with a company that can produce a technology or product that's complementary to their own so that they can create a system solution or they want to add something to their sales engine. So because they have a very clear visibility of why they are collaborating, they are also able to effectively make these collaborations successful over time. Let me come to startups. Now, you all know that there's been a lot of excitement over startups in the last five, six, seven years. A lot of it, of course, is quite justified because they have demonstrated a lot of dynamism. But there are also some challenges with startups. To my mind, if startups are to be an important contributor to innovation in India, one of the first things is they need to solve the right problems. I already told you about Niramai. One of the reasons Niramai is highly regarded as a startup is it's solving a very important problem. Breast cancer is one of the most, you know, dangerous diseases around for particularly uh, afflicting Indian women. And if it's detected early, it can be cured, but often it doesn't get detected early. That's the problem. And the reason it doesn't get detected early is partly social, partly technological. But when you have something like an alternate method, like thermal imaging, which can do it in a non-intrusive, a safe and a low cost way, then obviously you have a much better chance of detecting breast cancer early. So this is a good example of trying to solve a right problem. Another company is a startup called Vigyan Labs, which actually is based right here in Mysore. So you can probably go and see what they are doing. Uh, they won the NASCOM Innovation Award about a decade ago. They are again solving a very important problem. Today, data centers are some of the largest contributors to global warming. We all know that computing is shifting to the cloud. But what does that mean? There are these huge banks of servers which are producing huge amounts of heat. In order to cool those servers, they use a lot of air conditioning, a lot of power. They're just contributing to greenhouse gases and global warming. And what uh, Vigyan Labs did was they came up with an algorithm which enables you to reduce the data, sorry, the power consumption in a data center by up to 30%. And they've been quite successful. Their solution has been deployed with a lot of the top data centers in India. Similarly, Taral Tech is a startup started by one of our alumni from IM Bangalore. He again is taking a very simple problem. The fact is that people continue to access wa water from hand pumps, but hand pump water is often contaminated. Is there a simple way you can ensure that the hand pump water is not contaminated? And that's what he's working on. Again, to my mind, this is solving the right problem. And of course, startups need to collaborate with giants. That's also important because often they don't have the ability to scale up. One of the reasons my lab, which was one of the first companies whose test kit got certified for COVID was successful was because it collaborated both with Serum Institute and Sinjin in order to scale up its ability. So it was able to meet the growing demand very quickly. Okay, now let me come to the last part, which is academic and research institutions. Clearly, academic and research institutions are a very important part of the landscape and they need to also make a significant contribution to what needs to be done if we want to become an innovation powerhouse. So again, just like startups need to solve the right problems, so do academics and researchers. One of the people who I was very impressed by is the legendary professor at MIT, Professor Bob Langer. Many of you might have heard about him. If not, please do read about him. 
amazing number of startups and patents have come out of work done in his lab. And one of the reasons that's happened is just look at those four elements of what he considers an ideal research project. First one, it should be a huge idea conceived by recognizing a critical social need that could be met by inventing a platform product. It should have the potential to result in a seminal paper based on research to establish the science underlying the product, concept, and efficacy. Third, it should have the potential to have a blocking patent derived from the disclosures written along with the research. The goal being to have the patents filed before the paper, sorry, before the publication, so that, of course, it can be commercialized early. And, of course, the area he works is such that preliminary in vivo studies in animals that demonstrate the efficacy of the research. So you can see that he is looking at impact right at the time when he is planning the project. And this is reflected in the kind of outcomes that have come out of his research. We also need to create a whole set of innovators who have a better understanding of local needs. One of the interesting programs which was started several years ago is something called the Stanford India Biodesign Program. This is a collaboration between the design school at Stanford, All India Institute of Medical Sciences and IIT Delhi. The idea was to get researchers from different domains, including product design, marketing, engineering, science, to work as teams to first identify critical problems which need to be solved. How do they go about doing that? The team spends time first in a primary health center, then a district hospital, then a speciality hospital like Ames. During that time, they work closely with a set of doctors, trying to understand what are the problems the doctors are facing in the hospital. From that, they derive the key needs that need to be met. And then following a filtration process, they finally work on a particular problem and come out with a solution. This data is very old. Subsequently, there have been much more outcomes. But essentially, this has created a new cadre or a new set of innovators who are very problem-centric in the way they go about things. More of our academia and institutions need to adopt this kind of an approach. We also need to find ways in which academic and research institutions can connect better to industry. To my mind, one of the most successful examples of this has been the IIT Madras Research Park, which is now more than a decade old. The important thing about a research park is not only its physical location. Of course, it is located adjoining the IIT Madras campus, but it's in the mechanisms and policies that induce or motivate collaboration between the companies in the research park and the academics in the institute. I would urge you to study this model. If you want to retain your space in IIT Madras Research Park, you have to show evidence of continuing collaboration with IIT Madras. And for this, they have a very elaborate scoring system. How many projects did you give to faculty? How many internship projects did you give to students? How many ongoing sort of BTEC projects did you give to students which you enabled them to do in your lab in the research park? They have a whole lot of indicators and from this, they compute a research score or a collaboration score, which is a, you need to have a minimum score to continue your location in the IIT Madras research park. And at the same time, they have also tweaked the appraisal and incentive scheme for faculty within the institute encouraging them to collaborate with people in the research park and with other companies. It's these kind of mechanisms which are required to enhance collaboration between academia and industry. And last but not the least, you also need to look at maybe it's not always required to start from the research end. Maybe the important role that a research institute could play is even building on what people have already done. For example, there is this advanced research center for metallurgy and powder metallurgy in Hyderabad. And essentially, they realized that there's this whole set of class of coatings which industry needs. Rather than trying to start from scratch, they worked with a lab in Eastern Europe which had already developed one of these technologies. And instead, they worked on being the intermediary between that lab and the industry so that that process could be improved and transferred to industry in a more effective way. So they went through this whole process. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but they realized that ultimately what they wanted to do was make a superior process available to the industry. And a good way to do that was to start with somebody else's process 
work on it, improve it, and then share it with the industry. And we also need to look at new models for scaling up. I think we sort of have a system where on the one hand, you have a lot of academia research institutes. On the other hand, you have industry and startups. You need more intermediates. You need more organizations which can help in translation. And that's another important role which institutions need to play. So I'm going to just stop here. Let me just try to sum up what I was trying to share with you. I think the important thing is we know at the high level what the challenges are. I mean, essentially, inadequate investment in R&D. Institutions need to work in a more effective way. Uh, there is a lot we need to do, of course, on skill development, training, etc. Universities have to change their approach. Of course, the industry has to do a lot more to become more sophisticated in R&D and technology development. But of course, different stakeholders have different roles to play in this process. The government, of course, has a big role. I outlined some of the things they are doing as well as some of the new things I think they need to do. Industry and startups certainly have a role to play. But of course, being here at CFTRI on this important day of your foundation day, I think, of course, research institutes like CFRI have a critical role to play. And I think, again, I would strongly urge that there's a lot of challenges out there, identifying the right problems to work on, working backwards from those problems, and then coming up with integrated science and development, uh, sorry, technology programs that are aligned with those needs will go a long way towards making a lot of our R&D work much more aligned with the needs outside. So thank you once again for inviting me to this foundation day and best wishes to all of you.